Graham Nichols is an English author, artist, and expert on out of body experiences. His exploration of OBEs began after a series of spontaneous experiences as a 12 year old boy when he found himself floating a few feet above the ground. He claims to have now had hundreds of such experiences and has spent many years teaching and guiding people towards having their own, offering one on one coaching. Last year, he published his second book, Navigating the Out of Body Experience with the fitting subtitle, Radical New Techniques. I started by asking him about his best experiences and just how amazing they can be. I, I guess I guess the really the really powerful ones are, are the kind of peak experiences that you can have. And uh, um, I guess there is a general um, idea that with out-of-body experiences that they are all kind of of the same kind of quality and level, which... In my experience, is not really the case. Um, some are more mundane and more average, and, and others are more dramatic and um, uh, have a, have a much larger impact on you. So, of course, things like um, experiences I've had where I've been in space have been very memorable and and very dramatic. Um, experiences that have challenged my ideas about time, you know, precognitive experiences and also uh, going backwards in time as well um, one well, experience there sorry uh, yeah I was just going to say I, I know from my own handful of experiences that at least in those ones I had there was a, a very different state of mind to a norm to my normal state of mind um, it, it seemed incredibly peaceful and clear um, are, are these qualities that you've that you find also, or, or does it differ from experience to experience? I think it does differ um, to some degree, I guess in a similar way to how the depth of meditation can differ, um, or how maybe on one particular day you might be completely in the zone, you know, that feeling that sort of everything is working and going in a particular way. Um, I think there's something very similar to that can happen in our body experiences. Um, I think it's something to do with this interconnectedness that seems to be at the core of the experience. If we bring in ideas like Tom Campbell's idea of the larger consciousness system or ideas like cosmic consciousness or um, global consciousness, all these kinds of ideas all have this sense that consciousness is connected to a bigger sea of information, if you like, something almost like Jung's collective unconscious. Um, which I think is very close to a lot of these ideas and very, very in tune with what seems to happen. Um, so I think when you get closer to that, when you get sort of deeper into that, I think uh, the, the the quality or the sense of awareness changes because it's almost like you're using a more complex system rather than just your usual mental functions that you use with your ordinary consciousness. Suddenly you've got access to this more expansive more complex system and then straight away you you have more awareness and more ability to to understand things and to and to think essentially um, so it's like it's like you're getting access to some larger um mental network yeah that's exactly how how it seems to me and i think a lot of these descriptions like the collective unconscious um are are getting at that i think and you know, these, these ideas of archetypes and things like that that seem to be consistent throughout human experience do do seem to arise in the outer body experience. There's things like guides and, you know, uh, beings of light that people describe in near-death experiences and things like that. Um, I don't know what they are, but there's there's a sense that they do happen and they do get repeated, repeatedly talked about. So, um, you know, I tend to put them maybe into the category that it's some kind of archetype, some kind of um, uh, element of human consciousness that sort of repeats throughout time or throughout um, experience. So you, th you think that it's sort of a, a ground-up influence that, that things that are on, in our realm are imprinted in this other realm, or, or is there you know, a top-down influence too from, from other realms into this collective unconscious? Well, that's an interesting question because I guess uh, there are there are differences there. I do tend to be more the the, the bottom up rather than the top down kind of 
Um, the spiritual hierarchy thing has never convinced me totally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still, my whole attitude is always to still be sort of open and, and to just follow where the information leads me mm -hmm. and the experiences lead me. Um, this leads me to a question about you as an artist. Um, do you th do you have any thoughts about where inspiration or imagination come into this, and in, in terms of your own experiences and and the and the out of body experience? Well, I think it, in in the way that it expands consciousness in the sense of giving you access to that wider wider reality. There's there's that sense of inspiration that just ideas and just thoughts and perceptions just arise in a much bigger way when you're connected to that larger system, if you like. But then at the same time, I think there's the kind of after effect that you have this kind of realisation of an interconnectedness or almost a oneness, a kind of non-duality that arises from the experience. It's kind of, I'd say, more the after effect a lot of the time, you know, which can take longer to take effect on the individual in a way. I mean, for me, I had a lot of OBEs before those things started to impact me. But I think after time, they did start to have an influence. And then that did influence my artwork and my creativity and, and even, you know, my attitudes. I, I moved more towards a sort of scientific outlook, not, not just because I wasn't finding what I wanted in the sort of more esoteric ideas, but because I think um, I I was moving more to this idea of almost like a meditation of seeing things as they really are, this kind of trying to simplify and uh, remove any of the preconceptions and belief systems so that I could see as reality really is as much as possible. That was that was my aim, and that and there, then there was, there was a kind of realization that science is actually that. Um, if you think about inspiration and you think about some someone like Newton or something and the um, probably untrue but the story of the apple and you know that we all know um, those moments of inspiration I, I, I think they're very much in tune with that they're very much in tune with that whole kind of uh, process of starting to see reality for what it is I always think about the idea of for a long time we believed that the the sun revolved around the earth but then someone through a very simple experiment of being able to I, I think it was looking at the shadows and whatever of how the how the shadows were cast um on on the earth worked out that essentially the mm. the earth is revolving around the sun and i i love that real kind of ability to just <laughs> take a simple perception it's so obvious isn't it really it, it's so obvious, but, but we miss so much in a way. And I, I think even within this whole area of out-of-body experiences, there's been so much talk of um, bodies leaving our physical body and going off and, you know, all these different... It, it, there's so many preconceptions within, within the area that I think people for a long time have stopped looking. And I think what's interesting now um, is there does seem to be a few people at least who are who are saying okay well maybe maybe there's something different going on here maybe this is related to consciousness rather than to spirit bodies and and that kind of stuff um you know maybe the bodies are true i mean like i say in my second book i talk about both the body concept and the the, the sort of extended consciousness or extended mind ideas mm. but it seems the more you look at it, the more the extended mind interpretation, at least to me, mate, seems to yeah. make more sense. But in, in my experiences, I definitely felt a different body. Um, I seemed to see... Uh, mine was transparent and I was able to pass it through a low ceiling. I, was, I passed my legs through a low ceiling. Have you, have you experienced this body? Yeah, I, I've experienced the body many times, fully yeah. clothed, um, <laughs> with uh, various colours of energy and, and all those kinds of things. Um, but I've also experienced nobody and being more like a sphere for, with 360 vision. Um, so uh, the, the point is, is there's many different forms that, that you might take within an experience. So we have to ask the question, so what's going on there? Um, so over time, I've, I've come more to look at it maybe that we... 
we have a particular default understanding of how we experience the world and that default understanding essentially goes with us um, and other people can even see and, and interpret that that um, that conscious projection if you like um, and, and in that sense people sometimes even see you wearing the clothes that you're wearing on that particular day or something like that. When, when you say other people who do you, who do you mean this is people who are sharing the uh, the out of body experience with you? Um, no, that that's less common. It does yeah. happen, um, but but what's more common is someone will, someone who's physical and just going about their normal day to day life will describe. The most common is seeing a kind of shadow form. That's the most common uh, description. But sometimes people will literally see um, the other person um, as if they were there physically. They'll look at them and they'll see a fully clothed person standing. But then that person will disappear or something like that. So um, that that that's that does happen as well. So it's you know I, I I tend to wonder what you know how that might work, and I, I guess skeptics uh, raise mm. the question if it's you know if it is a spirit body coming out, why does it have mm. clothes? You know why do ghosts have clothes? You know <laughs> all these kinds of questions that yeah. that skeptics. Uh, raise and and you know I do take them on board and I let you know I probably uh, engage with more skeptical material than I do the other side these days um, and it and you know the, my conclusion is that because we're dealing with consciousness because we're dealing with an interconnected consciousness and an, or an extended mind in some form then the mental image the the sense of self that we carry with us. Um, is essentially what the other person is perceiving. Mm. That, that's what I think is most likely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not too fantastical to think that the minds or the minds, you know, the, the mutual minds involved could create clothes. You know, when you think about what our minds create in dreams, yes, um, exactly. such details are, are, would be easy to, to fashion also in, in an uh, out body experience. Uh, yeah, sure. So it, 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 I mean, it makes sense to me that um, if if you start to look at sort of models like Hammeroff and Penrose's um, or core ideas and ideas of you know interconnected minds, Rupert Sheldrake's morphic fields, whatever particular interpretation you you go for, um, there is this idea that information, thoughts, perceptions could be extended away from the physical body. And therefore, another mind, another in interconnected mind in that system, could pick up on that information. Mm. So essentially, could see an image of you that mm. is contained within your mind. Or I mean, we don't to, we we don't really know. We have, you know we're so far from knowing what the mind is and what thoughts are. Anyway, it seems yeah. like you know we are adrift on a sea that is all mind, and we think we can surf it to an extent and shape it. But you know, ultimately. It's a big sea that we're on, isn't it? Is that yeah. a metaphor that works? Do you think? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and it works for the out body experience as well as everyday experience. So I, I think that's that's what's interesting. I think when you start to think in that way, you realise that it's actually bringing the out body experience much closer to our everyday life and much more in line with our understanding of the world as it currently is. Yeah, and just to go back on the on the question again. How how enjoyable are these out of body experiences? You know, are they blissful? Or you know, is is it wondrous? What what is it that? How can you describe it in terms of those superlatives? You know, the, the best ones for you. What is it that you the, that you most enjoy about them on, on that level? Um, there's a, the, a multiple levels. I think transformative um, is a word I often you know because it does feel like maybe all of the all of the stuff or the the baggage of your psychology in many ways gets kind of just released and, and let go of and completely, um, I, I, I find having an out-of-body experience a very, um, it releases a lot of stress. I find myself lifting out into a, mm. into an experience and it's almost like any, any tension or stress or anything like yeah. that just dissolves away. Then the experiences can be stunningly beautiful and, and transcendent and, does it always leave you the stress and, and so on? Yeah, that is a consistency. Yeah, well, that's interesting because in the discussion group that we have here, and that um, sometimes I, I put the discussions online, um, 
the last one we had was about the ego and we were, we were trying to you know get to grips with it and I don't think it made the podcast but I was talking to someone after um, about what the ego is and, and I remembered something from esoteric thought about that we actually consist of three different parts and you know we lose the personality at death um, and that there is another that there are another two things that go with us into you know you know beyond this life do you th is there any correlation there in that you know the out of body experience you're you're dropping the per some elements of your personality or ego in this experience um it it would make sense i i couldn't answer exactly what those elements are but um there do, there does seem to be some some degree of that but i also think it seems to depend to some degree on the individual as well i, I think there's a there's obviously um, a, a range of interpretations on what an out-of-body experience is, and people do describe different degrees of, of how the experience affects them and things like that. Um, but within my particular approach of trying to sort of, I guess, approach it in a very um, non-belief system sort of based way and, and, and let go of all of that stuff. I guess that's part of my motivation in a way. I have a very um, uh, Shoshen sort of, you know, like the, the Buddhist idea of the beginner's, beginner's mind. Beginner's mind, yeah. yeah. You know, that that's kind of um, how I how I approach the whole thing, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. As long as, long as it's not a, um, a a too scientific approach, because another theme that's come up in our discussions is, um, you know. When, when I think it's I think it's it's right that we should be circumspect about our experiences, um, but we feel uh, some of us in our in our discussion group have felt that you can you can be too rational and uh, you can lose any sense of uh, um, assumptions or philosophy or mythology which which give you a, a sense of meaning from moment to moment in always waiting until you know all the data is in which is a, you know a scientific method and it can kind of um drain all the color and of life because anything that happens to you subjectively uh, you tend to reject until you can be you know fully convinced and prove it objectively so you know do you feel that that, that can be a danger or is it just more a case of you, you keep some things private than what you would um expound upon publicly no, I no, I, I think my my first book um, is very very revealing and mm. very uh, emotional, and um, uh, people often uh, you know are quite surprised by how much I reveal and how open I am in in that book. Um, no, I, I I talk I talk about very very subjective experiences in that book, experiences that in no way I can really analyze scientifically. Other than to say that they were maybe archetypal experiences, like I mentioned, or um, put them into that kind of category, but um, no, I don't analyse within the experience itself. But I, I guess um, when I'm when I'm sort of uh, trying to move the whole area forward, which I think is really important, and you know, I'm, I'm trying as much as possible within my work to move the area of OBEs away from the sort of superstitions and the sort of New Age commercialism and yeah. things like that, and actually engage with what might really be going on, and, and, and that's yeah. very important to me. I guess it's about knowing what you know and, and knowing what you don't know, and not not sure. speculating too far ahead of that. I think it's fine. You know, I, I have my personal interpretations and personal opinions and things like that about how I look at it, but I guess I'm very reluctant to um, tell other people that that's how they should think. You know. I, I think the, the bottom line with it is uh, I'm trying to avoid an ideology that then becomes like a cult or becomes like a, a dogma or, you know, these are the traps that we've historically fallen into, both in esoteric and religious senses. And I think these things shouldn't be in that context. And I think we should sort of approach them with how I described science earlier, rather than a sort of dogmatic science, more of a an idea of just trying to see what might really be going on rather than, you know, oh, you know, this is this, that is that. Because I think science can become very dogmatic as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not interested in this sort of, you know, bo 
body of information that sort of tries to tell people this is how how the world is and there's no room for any any possibility of new ideas when we know that science changes and evolves yeah. and moves and grows all the time you know so you talk about the uh, the new approaches of having an out-of-body experience. That's how you, I think you begin the book there. Um, how would these new approaches differ from the old ones, and what were the old ones? Um, well, the old ones would be the, the classic sort of visualization approaches, like the body of light approach, which would be, for example, imagining a, a figure standing at the foot of your bed and, and then imagining transferring your consciousness into the figure and all is that the, is that the classic one is it that's a really classic one yeah. i mean that one goes back to the golden dawn and you know there's all the sort of occult organizations and where did they, where did they the get it from where did they get it from um hard to say <laughs> um you know we only have the literature of of the time you know mm. um it's hard to know exactly where those early right techniques came from someone must have devised them but the I east <laughs> well i i yeah. doubt it um, really I, I think in the in the east out of body experience books tend to be western books uh -huh. um i mean when i spent time in india and places like that you you have all the books on meditation and they're generally all eastern writers but then when you get to things like astral projection out of body experiences it tends to be western writers so it's something that's more associated with the West, I would Didn't say. Didn't the Tibetan Buddhists have a tradition of dream yoga? Yeah, sure. Um, but, but again, I think it's uh, slightly different. And um, I, I think, yeah, I, I, we, I talked about this at the recent Gateways of the Mind conference that I spoke at. There was uh, Michael Katz there, who's a, a sort of Buddhist scholar and has written about dream yoga. Um, and he was describing this whole idea of um, they they encourage the sense of um, going into an out of body experience because it prepares you for the bardo or the or the afterlife, um, and and increases your chances of being to move being able to move beyond the illusory um, aspects that come into the experience in the early parts of the bardo experience. Which is a fair hypothesis. Sorry? I think that's a fair hypothesis, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so, so that's another, that's another sort of way or kind of angle to look at it. And I think the Buddhist bardo notion is quite in line with, um, the t types of things I'm talking about. They actually, you know, describe that there is an illusory aspect to it because there's this sense of, uh, you know, these things that try to distract you in a way and draw you back into your own your own cycle of reincarnation, etc. So I, I find that quite quite interesting in terms of the, the religious interpretations of things. It seems the most in line with 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 what people actually experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, what would be the new uh, approaches to having an out-of-body experience? Okay, well, the, the new... I mean, there's quite a lot of different angles in there. I... I, I for example, introduce the G technique, which is a, a physical um, approach that uh, so is, is to do with using uh, muscle tension and, and uh, breathing methods to um, create the right state for the outer body experience. I talk about my immersive structures that I've built that um, basically create all of the elements for the outer body experience by creating that within your environment. And I talk about how you can actually um, create something like that on a smaller scale within your own home, you know, exploring things like the Gansfeld methods that's been used in, in telepathy and things like that. I talk about more of a kind of holistic approach, essentially, by looking at your everyday life. Because I think what has been the problem within OBE uh, study and research and, and techniques over time has been a focus on just doing a particular technique and not looking at your day-to-day -day life, not looking at stress levels, not looking mm. at all those different factors. Um, what I realized is half of the process with me is nothing to do with the technique I'm using in that particular moment. The technique I generally use to leave the body is a very, very simple one. What I realized is my methodology for leaving the body is actually a response to what happens, a response to the stimulus in the particular 
moment that I'm laying down trying to do the method. So it's not that I go like on, on a, you know, on a track and I do this particular method and then this happens. It's more, I lay down, I see how my, how I feel, see how my consciousness is. I see how, if I'm stressed, if I'm relaxed, if I'm tense, if I'm, you know, I, I observe my own state of being. And then from that, I select the right methodology for, for how I feel. So if I'm tense, I use more relaxation methods. If I'm, you know, if I, if I feel the vibrational state very strong, which, um, you know, the vibrational state's common before yeah. body experiences. If I experience that, then I know really that all I need to do is shift away from default body awareness, which is, you know, the, the normal way of looking at the world and perceiving it through our normal senses. So, you know, it, it's more, it's more in a response to the situation. So I guess I've sort of taken a lot of the, the assumptions about an out of body experience and I've inverted them and said, well, actually, this isn't really, um, I think how it, how it works. I think more that we need to immerse ourselves. We need to, um, break our, our normal understanding of how our, how our mind and consciousness is functioning. So then, for example, there's three dimensional, um, visualization techniques in there, which are not just visual. They're also sort of almost something akin to Qigong or something like that as well. So there's a sort of energetic level to it. Um, the book is also, uh, divided up by a profile. So you create a profile of yourself to find out what methodologies would be most likely to be efficient for you as an individual, because I also realized everyone is different. So that's, that's another factor that I bring in there. There's a focus on sort of sensory deprivation and things like that, which again, I haven't really seen dealt with before. I go into diet and explore, um, things that I think can help on that level. Um, really there's a whole range of, of new elements that I think uh, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen yeah. explored before. Wow, so it sounds ingenious. Um, so, so you, you'd um, you'd recommend people one to learn about you know their own profile, and two to to learn a, a few, if not all, techniques, and then you know use them or not use them according to how they feel. Yeah, well, by doing the profile, it, it gives you the ones that are most likely to match you as as a person um so for beginners it's good to maybe not swamp themselves too much but maybe you know uh select one or two that that seem to the map to match them personally quite well but yeah as you go with the process and as you develop you learn to to sense your or i encourage people to to learn to sense their own state of being and their own and respond to that accordingly so obviously, like anything, you it, it's a, it's a thing that you develop, and you, I, I can't just say to someone, you know, that, that this is what you'll feel and this is how you react. I mean, some books do that, but it's kind of ridiculous to me to say that to someone because you don't know what they're going to have. Some people experience sleep paralysis. Some people have their out of body experiences from a dream or a sleep state. Well, that's I, I, that's how I, I had my first one was from a dream. Okay. Um, sorry to interrupt. Go on, sorry, carry on. That's fine. I was just going to say, and other people have it from a waking state like me. Um, so there's more, those, those people are more, I guess, akin to something like a trance medium or, you know, that they're, they're very able to go into a trance state. Um, that's kind of how I've always been. I, I, I can naturally very easily go into trance states. I find meditation very easy. Yeah. Um, you know, even getting into a still mind and things like that is. Which, what, which most, meditation most, technique do you use? I, I prefer Zazen, uh, Zen meditation, um, but I but I do I do occasionally take other approaches, but that that's the one that consistently I've used most of the time. Just just more like a kind of no mind, very very sort of still still. Yeah, state. I think that's what I do. You know, I I I go into vipassana meditation, and I I'll go okay. on. I've been on a few retreats, but I, t I tend to just go as a server now because the retreats are so intense, and you know you can you can talk in the kitchen and have interaction, but still be on the centre. Um, but I think that I I've, I've tend to naturally move away from that, and, I, and what I do is just a, a kind of a no mind meditation. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, meditation has sort of 
it, it's it's not a direct method to have the OBE, but it has benefits to the OBE, I think. So um, that's that's kind of uh, another another benefit with it, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had uh, I would say I've had three precognitive dreams, and two of them happened while I was in a, um, on a retreat or, or serving on a retreat. Um, so, do, which might suggest that would that suggest that this this is because I'm in, in I'm I'm in a state where I've I've removed a lot of the clutter of my own personality and my own things, and that's opened me up to a to you know glimpses through time. I, I think partly, probably, but I, I also think retreats and workshops and things like that. Um, one of one of the, the bonuses of those kinds of situations is they place you in a very suggestive and very heightened state of being because you've actually gone physically. If you think about hypnosis or neurolinguistic programming or something like that, you know, if you can use a very physical um, anchor, essentially, something to root you into a particular um, mindset, um, it will be more effective. So um, if you actually make the, the statement of going to a physical location and going through a process you're you're going to automatically put yourself into a more conducive and heightened state. In my first book, Avenues of the Human Spirit, I talk more about my retreats and things like that, which I don't go to an official centre. My kind of approach was always to go out into nature. I would usually just find a stream or something like that in the Brecon Beacons or the New Forest or somewhere like that and would just follow the stream out into the woods. So I would have water and fresh water and whatever, and then uh, string up a hammock in the in the tree and then just basically spend the whole time doing spiritual practice. Um, so that's kind of, I like to do that at least, you know, hopefully once a year, maybe a few times a year if I can, but that's kind of uh, a key practice that I like to do. So, um, so you, you, the the books are, or the, at least the latest book is a, is about you know enabling out of body experience for people and and I think you 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 teach people too. Um, do you think these experiences are for everybody? Um, are they desirable? You know, what, what what is there to be gained for the individual from these experiences? And are there are there any are there any dangers, you know, after all, you know, we have these physical bodies and these lives. Um, is, are we, are we leaving our physical bodies too soon? Is that, is it, what would you say to those questions? Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, no, I don't, I don't think we're leaving our bodies too soon. I think they, I think it has a healing benefit on, on one level. I do think there's a, there's a benefit to health, for example, um, that I, I, I'm not sure where it arises from. Um, if there is some kind of energetic aspect to this, um, if things like Reiki and energy healing, uh, are genuine and, and do have the effects that people describe, I think possibly the types of energies experienced in an out of body experience could be related to that. And so I think there's a kind of healing benefit. I think there's a sense of um, losing fear of death. That's something that um, has definitely happened with me. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a real kind of benefit on that level. But then just the huge, amazing, expansive excitement in a way of just having this sense that the the mind or consciousness can go anywhere, can see anything, can learn new things, and um, obviously there are limitations on it. I think some people exaggerate the amount of controllability in these experiences, mm. I think, really. Would um, you ever um, warn anybody away from it if perhaps um, you noticed something in their character or, or in the way they were living their, their physical lives? The reason I ask is because, uh, you know, I was, I, I was fascinated, you know, by the experience and I, I tried to have them and, you know, I had a few, um, and then I was on a, a meditation retreat, and I had a dream which warned me away from them. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was a, it was a profound dream that um, that made me realise that I had to focus on the physical body a bit more and, and the life I had here. Um, I can see personally that that was, you know, personal to me, and you know, 
Mm -hmm. I had to become more balanced and grounded. Uh, but w would you? Is that anything that, you, that that's been flagged up in your research? Um, it's it's not really something that's a huge issue. But I, I guess if if someone has a history of psychosis or um, if there's a particular imbalance in their in their understanding of things, you know, if they're a particularly ungrounded person, as you say, um, then I, I I wouldn't necessarily advise the ungrounded person away from doing it i just might advise them to include or to look at more grounding practices i mean that's that's another advantage of taking this more holistic approach that i that i focus on because if if in that sense i when i teach i don't just focus on the techniques for obes i look at the person's whole life and i say okay do you actually have enough time to do this? Are you too stressed to do this? Are you, you know, how healthy are you? You know, I look at all of these aspects because I think they're all, they're all key. If you get the foundations right, if you like, the day-to-day -day life aspects, then the out-of-body experience just becomes much, much more likely, um, just naturally, essentially. So all that ha has to be done then is to put in a few extra you know, uh, extra yeah. elements and, and you're there. Yeah. So, so, so say if you get to that point where, you know, you experience the vibrations or, you know, you're very keenly aware that an out-of-body experience is, is uh, a possibility. There is the problem of fear, which I think you talk about in the book. Um, mm -hmm. I, n I never got away from my physical body. There was always a, a strong gravity around my my chest, I guess it was. I could lift my head up. I could move my limbs out, um, but I couldn't. Um, you know what? What I call escape the gravity of the body. Would mm -hmm. that? Would that have been? I, I, I wonder if that was an unconscious translation of my fear of leaving the body, or, or would that be some some other thing coming into play there? It's quite a common uh, situation. I, I think it's just um, to do again with the sort of default body awareness. Um, so I think the solution to that is usually to look at methodologies that break that sense of where the self is located and things like that. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of the, the, the approach I take with that. And that usually, um, gets beyond, gets beyond that problem. But yeah, I mean, there, there's certain common problems that, that come up and fear is, is one of the, the key ones, but there's a, there's a group of three essentially. There's, um, excitement fear and over analyzing the experience um those are the three things that often bring the person back to their body or stop them leaving fully um so those three things have to usually be addressed so when i'm coaching someone i you know i have to look into those and see if that person has any issues with those things and those have to be dealt with right at the beginning um so yeah, yeah. So in in the book, you um, do you talk about your your um, experiments with Rupert Sheldrake to do with telepathy? Um, I think I I may uh, mention them briefly, but I don't, I don't go into any detail about them. Not. So what what can you tell us a little bit about them? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, um, that arose because Rupert, uh, we were having a conversation one day um, about. Uh, the whole idea of um, the sceptical criticisms of uh, telepathy research. And one of the criticisms that had been directed at him was that he he allowed for the possibility of, use, of using mobile phones or some kind of uh, uh, device in order to to be prompted to what the correct answer was. I mean, it was quite ridiculous claim because, you know, it would have it would have required so many people to be cheating to actually um, make the results uh, void. Um, but nevertheless, this was one of the one of the uh, options that the that the sceptical community were were using to to discount his work. Um, so he he came up with the idea that maybe if we found a location that didn't have any any signal possibilities, so something like a bunker or an underground basement, something like that, uh, where there would be no signals. Um, 
So he asked me if, uh, through my, through my art background or art career, if I knew anywhere suitable. So I sourced, um, a group of, uh, possible places and, and we spent a day going to a few of them and, and having a look. And, um, he, he eventually decided on, on a basement in Shoreditch, um, which had very thick concrete walls and a steel door and, and, uh, when we when we tested in there, there was no signals. It was completely kind of shielded. Um, and then we also, from actually a sceptical friend of mine, um, I borrowed a device that cancels out uh, mobile phone signals within a 100-meter radius. So we had that within the room as well. Um, people didn't know that was there. So even if there was some way that they could maybe leave the room, and make a call or something like that, they would have had to move a hundred meters yeah, yeah. away in order to make the call. So, right. So basically, but would, we, wouldn't you need to also have some independent observer there, like uh, James Randi sitting there as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, if James Randi was, was someone, yeah. someone who who, you, who could you be trusted, trust, yeah. but there, there's lots of um, issues with his yeah. honesty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean the, the thing, the thing with if you think about some, this is a good point actually, because if we think about things like the uh, experimenter effect that's often talked about um, within parapsychology, that skeptics seem to get negative results, whereas proponents seem to get positive results. If you think about something like priming um, that's that's used within, uh, for example, you go into a supermarket and you see all the, the fresh flowers at the front of the supermarket. This is just psychology uh, put there in order to make you feel positive and to feel that the that the food that you're going to see is fresh. The flowers are there as a priming tool. Um, it's a well-established psychological fact. Um, skeptics will generally agree that if you put... Um, it, it can go as far as if you give someone a cold coffee or a warm coffee at the begin, beginning of an interview, um, the there will be a difference in how people respond and how positive the interview goes. Um, so if we then apply this to the idea of a skeptic like Randy sitting in an experiment looking at someone, or as I've seen people like Chris French following dowsers around with a clipboard, you know, <laughs> writing down what... I mean, if you, if you apply psychology and you apply the idea of priming, this would be hugely detrimental to people's performance. Um, so you do have to wonder about things like that. So I generally think within the design of the protocol of any experiment, um, skeptics really are a very complex and difficult uh, aspect to have involved, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. I, so I, what was the outcome of the of the uh, experiment? Were you were you going out of body to to be telepathic in this? Uh, experiment? No, no, it was it wasn't it wasn't uh, me doing the experiments. I was organising it and I was organising the people for the experiments. I later took part in some of his precognition, um, computerised precognition experiments, but. I, I wasn't taking part in the telepathy experiments. We were just organizing them. Um, this was more my personal investigation to see if there was some sort of direct scientific support for these things. Because I guess one of the things that people would often say to me when I talked about parapsychology is, oh, you can't trust that. They're all fraud or it's all manipulated or whatever. So I want, in some sense, I wanted to see for myself what goes on and and I could see for myself that you know Rupert is a completely genuine person um, there's no way he was manipulating any of the data or anything like that so um, you know and most of it you know I, I did all the wiring um, I took the participants downstairs you know he had no involvement in in any of that so um, I, I find it very dubious to sort of criticize him on those kinds of uh, levels but you know this is this is the difference i guess between sort of armchair skepticism that just dismisses things and people who actually go out there and do experiments and actually yeah. uh, see see for themselves what's going on so. yeah 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 it's uh what we what you might call a priori skepticism isn't it mm, yeah um 
they have a, a world view and they feel uh, legitimated in doing whatever they can to put off the other side because they're so sure they're right. Hmm. Some of the worst skeptics, anyway. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think I think uh, people like Chris French are are quite fair and and balanced in their in their skepticism, but but individuals like Randy, I think, harm skepticism, science, and parapsychology. I, I think they're they're very un unhelpful to yeah. to the whole thing. Okay, um, you mentioned the the vibrational state which I've experienced and which is uh, uh, it, it it gets the attention. It's pretty pretty strange. What do you, what do you think is happening there? And, and do you have um, any ideas generally about what what's happening neurologically in the in the out of body experience? I, I think that the vibrational my personal theory on the vibrational state and other states is also. The void state, which is kind of a term I've coined, um, because in my work with people, especially coaching one on one, I found that more and more people describe to me not the vibrational state, but a kind of um, black, sort of womb like state, not unpleasant, a kind of feeling of being almost like meditation, but maybe. It, but different, sort of like they, f they, they feel they're not conscious, but they're not unconscious either, some in-between state. Now, the void state is another signifier that you're close to an out-of-body experience. Um, sure, surely you must be conscious in, in some way. Yeah, like I say, yeah. semi-conscious. Yeah, yeah. but, but there's no standard cognition, there's no standard imagery, there's no, there's mm. no hypnagogia, there's nothing like that. It's just a sort of black void feeling. Um, it, it can, uh, as, as you come out of it, that's when things get interesting and that's when other elements come in and that's when the out of body experience can take place. But once you're, when you're actually in it, it's more this sort of neutral in between state. Um, but uh, it, it's just another signifier like the, like the vibrational state. But what I think these states are, my personal view, is that they're part of the process of shifting away from your from your standard body awareness, from your uh, your normal "I'm looking out of my senses" kind of feeling of the world, um, the uh, the standard sort of um, Cartesian sort of dualist kind of idea of looking out of your eyes at the world from through your theatre of your of your of yourself kind of thing. Um, once that starts to break down. Once that sort of general sense of how you look and view the world starts to break down, I think that there's an activation of this um, sort of shifting going on, and I think something like the vibrations or or the void state are signifiers that 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 process is taking place and that shift is happening. That's my personal theory of of what it represents. Yeah. So as, um, if, as if consciousness is withdrawing from the avatar. If you like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all just, uh, you know, the the materialist would say that consciousness is is created by the brain, but um, I guess in your model, consciousness merely pours itself in and attaches to to the body. Um, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I. I I, I'm not completely anti the idea that consciousness arises from the brain, but. But I think that if it does, it's extended beyond the brain. Also, that that's kind of maybe more how I would how I would look at it. I think maybe the information or the or the process that we understand as consciousness maybe arises from a much much deeper level and arises up through the brain, possibly. So you could say that it's coming into the brain from it, from an external source. But I I think it's probably a bit of both. I think I don't think it's either or. You know, it's it's uh I think the brain is very, very important in the process, but but I think that more and more we will discover that that quantum levels are also fundamental to to, the, to consciousness and, and and brain function and things like that there's already new new studies um, finding that uh, the quantum effects are are part of the process of how neurons communicate with each other and things like that. And Anthony Peake's work, obviously, he's he's talking a lot about 
these kinds of things and and bringing in the the relationship between quantum effects and and neurology and yeah those kinds of areas anthony peak he talked about um the he calls he came up with the intrasomatic model and i think in his book out of body experience he talked about um one's consciousness go into a kind of a simulation of of external reality mm. um have you found i mean in my, in my novel i i i wrote according to the idea that um the out of body experience could be used to eavesdrop on the real world and bring back information um mm. w- where would you stand on on that question is that possible um sure well well i th- i think probably remote viewing is has been shown to be a more controllable methodology for doing that kind of thing to some degree um, but i i think out of body experiences can can be used in that way but i i think the the thing with out of body experiences and uh andy paquette who's another out of body experiencer who i've dialogued with and um uh has has a very similar um background to me we're both vegan we both don't take drugs or drink etc um very very interesting that we're we're so similar um, and our experiences are also very similar and he's had a lot of verified experiences as well and his 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 kind of idea is again that the controllability factor is more the the peak experiences especially are when you kind of go with them and when you let the experience unfold naturally and i think in terms of experiments and in terms of understanding obes we need to sort of look more at the the natural context that they happen a bit more like near death experiences how um unfortunately i i think maybe the lab type approach is is always going to be limited with obes i don't know for sure because no one's done any experiments for sort of 50 years but um but but it's it, it seems it might that might be the case but yeah in terms of observing objective reality um i think and anthony sort of revised his views somewhat since we've been dialoguing on on that because i i guess he didn't find any any very good cases of of objective observation of reality but but i i've i've sort of shown him some of my own and uh pointed him towards for example Penny Sartori's research and the patient 10 case and the uh Pim van Lommel's research with the the 44 year old man who was in a coma who uh saw his false teeth be removed and things like that uh which Pim van Lommel uh feels is one of the strongest cases from his research so i think there's a lot of good um verified cases but um there's 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 many more as well Janice Holden did a review of of many many of them um so there's there's lots of good cases out there actually she found that 92% of all of all um out of body experiences in in a cardiac arrest type situation in a critical situation were veridical um and only uh, only 2% were actually completely inaccurate or um illusory in some form Yeah, I mean that when I had my experiences I I felt that um it was the real world that it was happening in, and and mm. uh, I I you know I I would uh, argue that with uh, with Anthony. Um well I I think I think he's more open to that now yeah. than 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 when he wrote um the out of body experience book. I I think um he's sort of revised that somewhat. Um I think I think we're very me and Anthony are very similar in terms of our understanding that I think the out of body experience is some form of um quantum extension of the mind or or something along those kinds of ideas and I do think that there is a it, there is a what I, what I call a kind of filtering or a translation process of of the data of the real world if you like because I don't think that we literally have senses as in eyes with retinas um you know responding to photons hitting them and you know the brain then creating a visual interpretation of the world i think what might possibly be happening is there is a a translation by the brain but bypassing the senses so if the brain is entangled in this way or extended in in this way then the information comes 
not via the senses, but via some external medium. So the data, the information of the out-of-body experience comes into the brain and is translated by the brain in some form. And I think, I think possibly the reason that sometimes you get these interesting colors, like I described earlier, the sort of uh, blue gray, um, exper- experiences I've had, um, or, or the various shades in, in a recent lecture I gave at the Society for Psychical Research, I, I talked about the key different, um, types of color and, uh, the visual format that my out of body experiences take. And the interesting thing with that is they match very closely with, with the functions of, of the eyes and how, how the brain actually sort of translates visual experience. For example, the blue gray type experiences would work very well with scotopic vision or when, or when the, the, the low level light conditions that, that the eyes shift into this scotopic vision. So, um, they go into a blue green scale. Your, your eyes start to only respond to the blue green scale of, of light. Um, so it's kind of interesting when you look at it like that, because then you start to realize, okay, that's quite consistent with a lot of my experiences seem to match in some way what's hap- what, how the brain would translate visual information. But obviously because the eyes aren't involved, the brain maybe is translating that as a low light experience. Yeah, yeah. Or, or and, so, and which suggests that the brain is still involved in, in the perception. Yeah, which, yeah. which like I say, I, I don't think it's an either or. I, I think yeah. it's both. I mean, it, it has to be involved in some, in some form, I think, because even, I, I, I think it's, it's likely that memory is, is in the brain to, in some form i know we don't have a lot of evidence for that but i think the brain is quite important in the whole process so even if it's just the memory of the experience that i still think that how that memory is stored or translated is still um a a, a brain function Mm -hmm. what would you like your books and your work in general to achieve um both you know for yourself and for um for others well i guess there's multiple levels to what i'm trying to do i'm trying to bring a more rational understanding to the area and and move it away from what i see as quite harmful ideas you know i i mean I, i think a lot of the a lot of the new age type ideas can actually limit people's perceptions and be quite harmful in in some senses so i'm in in a way i'm sort of standing against that to some degree and i'm trying to say let's let's really look at these things objectively and let's um let's say well are there are there cases we can show up good examples and i've tried to put examples of cases that i've had that have been witnessed and verified and things like that and then i'm trying to look at ways to improve the chances of people actually having their own experiences because as as many people have pointed out the best way to really know what you think about these things is to have them yourself and the more people that have them the more they'll contribute to the field the more we'll uh, get people engaging with it and and i would like to see some more research as well some more actual um work being done on this area because i've approached many scientists but unfortunately there's not that much interest in in researching it and what do you think there is to be gained by by learning about the experience and spreading the experience to to gain more understanding of our consciousness and and the, and the fundamental aspects of who we are i think consciousness is is really everything i mean it's uh, um what goes on in our in our minds is 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 all we can ever be sure of as as others have pointed out as well so we 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 have this situation where unless we engage with with our consciousness unless we explore that we're never really going to have any sense of of the of of the potential of our lives really um so i i think the outer body experience is one of the few ways that you can directly encounter an extended form of your consciousness <laughs> <laughs>